We're so excited to have Augustino Pintus with us today. Augustino, thanks so much for coming on the show. I'm honored to be here, guys. Thank you so much for having me on. Well, Augustino, we're going to dive right in here, and we're going to ask, as a former tech guy, how did you transition from being the CIO to a VP of tech to diving into real estate? Well, you know, the first I could start with the whole premise as to why I got into this in the first place is that when I was a young C-level CIO, CTO at this big publicly traded company, I was making bank, I was doing well, I had the cars, houses, and all that, and I was still scared to death. I was scared. Like, I was always worried that no matter, even though I built up some great success with this company and helped them get to the top of their respective market, so to speak, I was always scared that I'd be the next one cut, even at the C level, right? Yeah. And the whole premise behind me getting into real estate was because a friend of mine that I was working with, he was, I ran IT, he ran operations. He says to me, he says, you got to look at real estate. That's all he said. <laughs> I buy houses. You should buy houses too. And I'm like, so at that point, young guys in my early thirties were flush with cash, just gone public. I'm like, Oh, all right. I mean, it's, <laughs> that, was, that was the premise. Like, well, okay, I guess so. I guess I can do that. So I figured, okay, I buy, I'll buy a house. So he, get, he refers me over to his broker and buy, buy a house at retail. That has shows you how much I knew what I was doing, right? I yeah. was buying stuff at retail at first, right? I was looking for that cash flow, a few hundred bucks a month. And if it worked, then I'll keep buying more. This is back way before 2008, you know? Okay. So a long time ago. So I was trying to buy as many houses as I can after seeing the, the cash flow come in, right? I'm like, oh yeah, I got to This is really good. I started going bigger houses, duplexes. I paid like four hundred thousand dollars for this fancy duplex, a duplex, two units, four hundred k. Wow. I did that. I don't recommend it. Today prices. <laughs> yeah, it's not good. But but the whole premise was okay. If I could buy enough of these houses, if I can get enough of them. I don't have to worry about someone firing me. That was that, that's so stupid, right? I mean, back then that was the, that was the mindset. The mindset was around scarcity, around protecting myself, as opposed to abundance, where it is today, where I'm trying to build as fast as I can a responsible por portfolio that generates income, right? Very different mindset, you know. But anyway, that was the whole premise behind it was just to try to protect myself, and even though it. it I was able to, to build up a good portfolio. I wasn't finished building the portfolio before they handed me the box, right? So even at the C level, you're still, you can still get the box. You know what I mean by the box, right? Can you unpack that for Westerners who may not know what it is? That no means they hand, yeah, they hand you the box and they say, pack up your stuff and get lost. You're done. <laughs> you're fired. Get out. You know, that's what it means. And uh, I've had the box handed to me many times, unfortunately, but I, I've also been been around for a while too. So, <laughs> uh, but I mean, ultimately, I've been an entrepreneur my entire life, and I think that's part of the reason why is that having that entrepreneurial spirit. It's very hard for me to to do that work for other people. You know, now it's like I work for myself, and I'm able to build something for myself. But more importantly, though, is when you take control of your future. You're not handing your time. The only, the, the only thing you have is that time that's been right. given to you as a gift. And you're handing it to someone else who's making a decision about your future. They could be deciding right now, you know what? Now's the time for Henry to get lost because I just can't afford him right now. And that's it. Then Henry's out on the street, right? Henry yeah. the developer's on the street. Ridiculous. It's scary, right? They're it's scary. That's, that to me is someone's opinion. Yeah, it's, it's way, that, that to me is way more scary than uh, to you know, worry about where, where my next meal is coming from because I don't really worry about that at this point. But you get my drift, right? I mean, that, that to me is way more scary, that false sense of security that we've been all, I guess, um, I just want to say- Conditioned? Into yeah. Conditioned, <laughs> yeah. tricked. Yes, it's all a trick. So Augustino, you mentioned something that uh, I've noticed wealthy people kind of take for granted that other people know. Uh, it's the scarcity versus abundance mindset. Yeah. But I didn't even know what that really meant just a few years ago. And I think some of our listeners may just now be discovering what that means. Can you kind of dive into what that means a little bit when you talk about an abundance mindset versus a scarcity mindset? Absolutely. Absolutely. So 
I actually did a video on this too. It's on, on the Bulletproof Cashflow uh, site too on YouTube. Okay. Check that out too. I, I, go, I go deeper into this, but there are, we'll call it two, two mindsets. Scarcity, meaning it's, it's the whisper of 10,000 generations that's in our brains. It's hard to ignore. It's very, very difficult to ignore because it's, it's been ingrained into our DNA. And what I mean by that is at the core of what we are as beings on this planet, we are animals. At one point, we would, the reason why we do what we do is because, uh, you know, say the whole scarcity mindset, we would, or even let's, let's talk about getting fat, all right? right? Overeating, right? Why do we eat a lot of sweets? Why do sweets taste good? Well, because... We used to have to eat a lot of sweets because it wasn't 10,000 years or 50,000 years ago, even 10,000 years ago, it wasn't readily available, right? And you had to do that because you wouldn't know when your next meal is coming, right? Or you had to worry about getting attacked by a saber-toothed tiger, so you're always in fear, right? You're always looking around, oh my God, something's going to attack me. That whisper of 10,000 generations still exists today. Absolutely. So once that condition is set... And our parents, this, this, is, this is something that's taught to our, our great-great-grandparents, it's taught to their, their, our grandparents, our parents, and then to us that you must save your money. Save every penny you have. Don't give up anything. Save. You know, don't, don't, don't wealth or, or debt. No, that's stupid. Don't, debt is bad. Don't do that. That's ridiculous. You, know? you don't want to be in debt for anything. That's all conditioning for around scarcity. You have to try to try to hoard and maintain as much as you can, you know, everything as much as you can, because you never know when we're going to get attacked by that saber tooth tiger or the next winter is coming, or if we're, if we're going to get a next meal tomorrow. Right. Right. Today, things are different. We don't have to worry about such things anymore. You know, if we lose, if someone loses their job tomorrow, they're not going to starve. They're not going to die. You know, there's support systems out there to help people. Right. Right. Yeah. So that's, that's, where the, that's where the shift takes place, right? In, in terms of abundance now, aside from under, this understanding of, you know, if something bad happens to me, I'm not going to just perish. <laughs> no, I'm not going to fall off a cliff and you know, no one's going to help me or anything else like that. It doesn't work that way. But more along the lines of understanding that there, uh, there are no limits, or rather, even more importantly, the, the limits are only what we define in our own minds. Right. That's, that's what it is. And, and often we mistaken our own limits for the, for the limits of everyone else. That's probably the biggest thing that, that we do. Right. So it's like, if someone's, Oh my God, Augustino could take on a, a $10 million building because he's special guys. Listen, I'm not special. I just, you know what? I followed exactly what I, what I would tell anybody I coach. I, I network with the right people. I demonstrate value. I, t I actually do what I say I'm going to do and I do the work. That's how, that's, I mean, I, 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 there's no other way to do it. You know, <laughs> there is no magic recipe is ultimately no what recipe. you're saying. There's no magic recipe. I mean, okay. I will admit being a CIO and working at that, at that level has taught me ways of reading and engaging people. I will admit that. But at the same time too, there's even people that, like when, when we're talking about coaching and we have people that we'll talk to about joining our coaching program and I'll have my guys still talk to someone and they'll say like, they don't want to invest the money. They don't want to, even, even the down payment, the thousand dollar down payments, like you, know, you can't get your hands on another thousand dollars. I mean, is, is that thousand dollars mean that much to you? I'm not saying it's not a lot of money, but if I can show you how to get to a million dollar property, would you want to at least give up a thousand bucks to at least try it out? I mean, seriously. I mean, think about that, right? Is a thousand dollars mean that much to you, right? <laughs> you know? Yeah, no, that's a very good point. Shift. It's and that's scarcity. That's the scarcity mindset. The scarcity mindset, the reasoning behind being wrong is more important than actually living an abundant life. Ridiculous. I it, yeah, th there's a lot that you mentioned there. Uh, a lot of it is our society has evolved way past and faster than we have as as beings living in it. And with that said, right, there's, there needs to be a mental shift that people need to, yeah. to come to. How do you coach people to say, hey, look, I understand you've been conditioned, but this is how you need to think. How do you help them unlock that potential? Well, first it starts with, before we even get to that part, understanding what their personal vision is, right? Uh, and by that, we do a vision board. We sit down to a vision board. I mean, I know it sounds hokey and whatever, but I, I right promise there. you. Yeah. yeah. I mean, my, my, <laughs> I, have one, I, I keep them all over the house. I keep them everywhere, right? But that absolutely works. 
Why does it absolutely work? Well, because you have something in your brain called the reticular activating system, okay? If you start taking pictures and putting them on paper and you put them up somewhere and, you, and every time you walk by, you look at it and you study it. You don't just look at it passively. You look at it actively. You're studying it and you're, and you're envisioning yourself there. It will happen your reticular activating system tries to find a way to make it happen. Like, uh, like a car. I think you see, I see you have a car on yours, right? Right. So what kind of car is that? That's the, uh, the Mazda RF, the little hard so, top convertible. So uh, not very common, but when you see one, I mean, when they're around, you see it. Right. I, I notice it way more. And now that I visualize myself in it, that's, and that's <laughs> the thing for me, it's a Tesla cyber truck. I already pre-ordered it. Right. I did the pre-order thing. Right. And now yep. I see Tesla's all over the place before <laughs> I didn't even notice them. Now as soon as I saw that truck, I'm like, that's the truck I'm getting, I'm getting that thing. And now I see Tesla's why the reticular activating system kicked in. That's why, right. It starts, it starts with that. But then secondly, it starts with now documenting your affirmations every day. You're, you're writing down your affirmations every single day, every day. When you first wake up before you start the day, you're writing down your affirmations and, as, as it's already happening today, right? So I have 12,000 apartment units. My, my gross monthly revenue is $200,000. I have a house on the beach in Miami and one in South America. I mean, I'm, write, I'm writing it out as if it's, it's already done. Because again, your reticular activity system does not know the difference. It doesn't know the difference, right? All that stuff sounds hokey, as I said, but that stuff works. Then what we do is, we go into studying, the, the, there's, a, there's a book, book list. Every week, they have to read a book. Every week, they read a book. I like now, that. Most people don't read a book a, 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 like a month or even a year for that matter. I mean, I'm reading, a, I, I probably take about five days to read a book, right? Uh, it could be on Freud. It's, it's usually on sales, psychology, um, personal development, something along those lines. That's, that's how you, you're, that's where the mental shift begins, Right? Because as soon as you get more knowledge in your brain, you start seeing the world very, very differently. And I don't read them. I actually listen to them is what I do. Right? But I have a book list, and uh, we're going to be publishing it out soon. It's, it's going to be a free book list. Anybody can download it and just download all the books, and you can follow along and all the books I'm, I'm listening to. It's, uh, right now I'm listening to An Introduction to Freud. Nice. Yeah, it's like Freud, right? Who would have thought? But yeah, right. <laughs> interesting, interesting dude. Very interesting dude. I'll tell you that. Yeah, it's pretty cool. So, but. Augustino, I'd love to. That that was awesome to help people get over kind of this fear or this stuck place, or to to help them really move towards achieving massive success in their life. And and I love a lot of what you said in there. I discovered that. Um, when I started to learn about building wealth. And before that, I, I really hadn't heard much, if any, of that. And I, I do remember when I first heard it thinking, gosh, is this real? I mean, it's worth trying to, but I have to say, you know, having some things on the vision board and they've started to come true. And as I, it's, it's really blowing me away how well what you're saying works. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah, well, and but part of it too, though, you know, Adam, is you got to take action. That's probably the biggest thing. Yeah. That's where people fall short. It's like, it's, you can't just wish it into existence. You kind of have to actually do some of the work. And the biggest thing with fear though, what is fear? We probably should define that up front, but fear, people are afraid because something, see, something is uncertain to them. The yes. reason why someone says, oh, how did that guy do it? He must be special. It's, it's a way for our brains to just disqualify it so, that it so the brain doesn't have to think about it anymore, right? Because right. you have to keep in mind, the purpose of our brain, what the brain does is to keep us working as little as possible. That's what our brain does. Our brain is, is, is just wants to keep you alive. That's right. it. That's all it wants to do. It does not want to move. That's why people have a hard time getting out of bed. There's sleep inertia, right? But people would rather sleep because it's fun just laying around sleeping, right? Who doesn't like sleeping, right? <laughs> but, but that's the thing though too, it's, it's, it, that's what the brain does. So the brain will, if you're gonna, you can either listen to uh, a bunch of podcasts or go to a training seminar or, or go to a coaching program, you could do that. Or you could sit in front of the couch and watch Game of Thrones, have some popcorn, some caramel popcorn and some, <laughs> and some ice cream, like what's better, right? And of course your brain's gonna try to come up with ways to trick you into doing the easy thing as opposed to doing the hard, the quote hard thing, right? 
It's a whole different mindset, whole different mindset. Yeah, yeah. That, that is really good stuff. Um, so I want to switch gears just a little bit and talk about uh, why a 401k may not be a good retirement plan. Um, so we, we hear from a lot of people that um, they, they like their date job um, and they don't want to leave that. Uh, at the same time, their retirement plan, their plan for how they're going to retire is by just putting money into a 401k because that's what most of us have been taught. Uh, and I was wondering if you have some thoughts on that and how someone like that might start to be able to learn about investing with people like us. You know, I'll tell you, when I was, when I was 19 years old, right? So my, my parents are like, they, my parents were not wealthy or anything else like that. I wasn't born with a silver spoon in my mouth, right? They, from Italy, uh, my, even, even for me, English was my second language, all right? Uh, my parents were right off the boat. And uh, so we didn't have a lot of money. So when I had this job, uh, I was working in a warehouse at the time or something like that. And the guy says, he says, if you put money aside into this plan, by the time you're 60, you're going to have a million dollars. And I'm like, wow, a million dollars. Yeah. That's, <laughs> I was, my mind was blown. I'm Me like, too. holy <laughs> crap, I need, I need to be doing that. Right? I had no idea. A million, a million dollars is not a lot of money. Right. It really isn't. Uh, I mean, I mean, I'm not, not that it, not, it is, but in the, in the span of giving up, you know, what, uh, 40 years of your life, it's not a lot of money. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Over, over 40, over a 40 year period. Yeah. The reason why they sell so hard, they get those people to show up into the offices with all the fancy brochures and all that. Why do they do that? They want control. They want control of your money. They're going to take that money. They're going to maximize that money and give you the leftovers. That's why. So even, even though that they're, they're going to do well, they're, and they'll, they'll, they'll say they're going to do well by you, right? But they, what they're going to do is they're going to take this, this, all this money that you've been killing yourself to create, all this energy, this fuel that you're looking to create, and then they're going to take it, invest it into the stock market, and then they're going to, um, you know, give you a small, a small percentage of it, right? So what I often like to tell people when, when I have a conversation like this is uh, Apple stock, right? So today's the, the 19th, 20, 12, 19, all right? So let's say, let's say it's the first, all right? Uh, so let's say it's the first, it's February the first. Um, what, what's the Apple stock at right now? 323.62. Good. So what's it going to be next month at this time? Don't know, Nobody right? Knows. Nobody knows. If I could tell you. <laughs> right. but I, I mean, I can tell you that my one property that on, on the 1st of February, it throws off $120,000 a month. That's the one property. I can assure you that this time <laughs> or whatever, that time a month from now, it's going to probably be the same, right? right? There's, there's, there's assurance that that property is going to throw off the same amount of money if it's because it's well run we put a lot of energy into running the property and running it well i'm in control of my own money i'm in control of the asset i'm in control of, of my money and i'm i know where the money is and i know what it's doing i i I, keep, I can i can take you guys to the property i can show you this is the property that we are all invested in here's yeah. the return that i'm going to give you at every quarter, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's great. Now, and, and just like what I said earlier about how the brain tricks us. Yes. It's easy if I don't have to deal with it. It's like, oh, it's, it's, it's so, but yeah, that requires thinking, right? So it's like, you know what? <laughs> I don't want to think. I don't want to think. That takes energy, right? Well, because <laughs> you, you only have a certain amount of glycogen. When you wake up in the morning, you have X amount of glycogen and you, you, and you deplete it by the end of the day. And if it's all gone, you, you know, it's all gone. That's it. You have to go get rest and then you re replenish it again. Same thing. I don't want to think about where, that, where my, money, my, my 401k money is going. So I'm just going to go ahead and sign this thing and send it away and that's it. It's ridiculous, right? Yeah. yeah. It's, it's, it, but at the end of the day, I understand why. I understand how they get away with it, right? It's because people, they don't want to do it. That's why like investing, even as a limited partner, is a great way to get into real estate with people you know and trust, still have peace, have a lot, usually the lion's share of a deal, 
and still throw off money and you're in control of it. And in, with a self-directed IRA, you get all the benefits of the tax savings, everything else like that, of, of, of being in a real estate deal yourself. It's a, it's a beautiful deal, but nobody oh, yeah. knows about it. Nobody knows about it. Why don't they know about it? Because it's a threat to the very people <laughs> that put it all together. It's very much it, so. That's, that's, that's why I, I, didn't, I didn't even know you could do a self-directed IRA like 10 years ago. I would I had no idea that was even a thing. Right. No idea. Most Ridiculous. people don't. Yeah, yeah when I don't. heard about it the first time, I was like, well, how do I not know about that? Why doesn't the majority of, why don't they know about this? It was so frustrating, but I get you, where, why. No, 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 Kevin, I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why, right? Because people instantly think it's a scam. Oh, Very true. It's a scam. Why? Tax-free? Be- Tax-free tax free wealth? It must be a scam. It has to be a scam. <laughs> why is that? Why do we automatically think that way? Because we've been conditioned to think that if it falls outside of this norm that's been already defined, it must be a scam, right? And again, scarcity mindset kicks in. Big wall goes up. Oh, scam time. Get away from it. No one told me about this. The guy that came to the, the, guy that came to the lunchroom <laughs> with his folder didn't tell me about this. <laughs> it must be a scam. <laughs> That's what it is. As people think it's, it's, it's untrue or it's a scam. I, and it's totally true. I've done it myself. My investors have done it. It's the real deal, guys. Whoever's listening, I'm telling you, I promise you, it's real. There's companies like Equity Trust and iPlan. They're all out there. They'll tell you how to do it. <laughs> I agree. And that's what I did. I took money out of my 401k. And this is what sucked for me is when I left that company, I spoke with the custodian. They said, well, you're no longer there. You can't do anything with it. You have to wait till this company, another company, so that you can roll it over. And it's like, so it's just sitting there. So I decided to move it to a self-directed IRA. For the people that, that uh, wouldn't necessarily take that big of a leap, how yeah. do you recommend them getting a little bit more comfortable with that? With, uh, with the 401k like self-directed IRA thing? Or, yeah, I guess just transitioning that, that thought process. Yeah, part of it is, is that, First off, understand you're going to encounter a lot of resistance. All right. There's a guy at, at Ameritrade. And when I was uh, a CIO and I, I racked up all the, all the money in the 401k thing, and uh, I, had, I, was gonna, I was moving it out to invest in a deal. I was going to invest in, in, my, in, in my first little multifamily thing. And he was all bent out of shape. Oh, my God. Was this guy bent out of shape? He was pissed. He was livid, right? I mean, that's a lot of money I took off his plate, right? But that's the first, the first thing you're going to encounter. Secondly, it's probably going to be your spouse, right? Their, their spouse is going to be like, oh my God, are you crazy? Yes, you're going to encounter all this resistance because it's counter to what everyone else is aware of, right? And then once, but you know what though? Start with a small deal. You know, oftentimes I'll tell people, it's like, so we're raising money for a very, for a very big historical property. Uh, I'll tell you guys about it on a future show once we close it. But um, this, this deal, it's a big deal, right? And I spoke to a gentleman, he wanted, and I never met him before. So I didn't want, I couldn't, I don't want to break any SEC rules or anything else like that. Wasn't trying to raise money or anything, but he told me he had a hundred thousand dollars to invest. I didn't say anything about, I did not ask him. I didn't tell him about any (laughs) returns or anything else like that. You know, I'm very careful about that. But I also said, listen, you know, if it'd be our first time working together, put down 50 or put down half of that, you know, start small. It's okay. You know, start, start with a small, small amount of money, get used to it, understand who we are, what we're about, and then you can go bigger from there. I mean, we've done plenty of deals with other investors and they've, I mean, just one right now, we closed on it already. We still had room in the fund and they're throwing down another 150 K, you know? It's like, yeah. It doesn't take long after they see those results for them yeah. to, but well, it, it's an education, right? They're it's, learning. It's, and, and so the first time in, once they see those distributions and they start to get the updates about the investment and, and how it's being managed, their eyes open up pretty quickly. Oh yeah. 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 For sure. The, the one deal I was telling you guys about the green room, we closed it in uh, July. We closed it in July by October where we mailed out the first check. And I think back in, uh, I think, yeah, January, we kicked out another, another batch of checks. I mean, it's like, so that's why it's like the investors are like, yeah, take our money. We want, yeah. we want more of this, you know? So it's like, it's super, but part of it is you have to make sure that you're investing with the right people 
that they know what they're doing, you know, they have good operation, they have a good deal, you know, and, and not to mention to performing your own underwriting. It's like I said before, it's like, this is, even though it's, it's passive quotes, passive investing, you still should do some work. You know, you still have yep. to put the work, put the work into understanding the area. What, what are they, what are they buying and what, how are they financing it? Who's financing it? You probably have to go that deep into the weeds about that, but it's always good as even as a limited partner to understand it, to improve your knowledge. And that way, the more information you have, the less fear you're going to have and you're going to want to do bigger deals. That's ultimately the driver behind it. So yeah. Augustino, you mentioned limited partner and some people may not know what that is, but oh, sure. can you talk just a little bit about what that means and how someone who's working a day job might find being a limited partner in a larger deal an attractive way to start investing? Absolutely. Absolutely. So, so let's say I'll, I'll give you like a, um, a scenario. So let's say for instance, I find a deal, I find a, um, a million dollar property. Okay. And, uh, I run the numbers, it cash flows, it looks good, super. So, um, but you know, I could, I have the money for the down payment for the earnest money, but I really got to raise $200,000, right? Cause I, know, I already talked to the bank. The bank will give me 800. I got to get my hands on $200,000. So how am I going to set this thing up? Well, you know what I'll do is I'll talk to friends, family, people that I know to go and raise that $200,000 right? So I'm going to be the general partner. I'm going to be the one that's going to run the deal. I'm going to make sure the property is, is cash flowing. I'm going to make sure that the toilets are all un, unclogged. I'm going to make sure there's no termites. I'm going to make sure that the tenants are happy for 30% of the deal. The rest of the deal is 70% of the deal is owned by the investors, right? So let's say like two investors put up the deal, or put up, put up the money rather, they each, each, each one of them is going to own 35% of that deal. So they own 35%. I own 30%. They actually own more of the deal than I do, right? I'm doing all the work. Now I get to make all the decisions. I'm the one who's, who's running the, running the deal. I'm making sure that I'm getting the financing. I'm signing for the debt. It's, it's funny because some people say, well, you, you have no, no skin in the game. No, 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 <laughs> no, 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 no. The, the bank doesn't even know who these other guys are, right? They know who I am. And if there's a problem and I stop paying, they're coming after me. Right. Right. So, uh, yeah, that's the thing right now. I'm going to, I'm going to put a little footnote here. 35% of the deal. Typically the lender won't, won't let anybody own more than 20% of the deal. Right. But you get my drift. It's like, it's, it's for a group of investors. They're the limited partners. The limited partners are putting up the money into the deal. Typically, as I said, they don't own more than 20% of the deal. It's important to, to mention but the thing is, is that they get to enjoy all the benefits of owning the real estate without any of the, of the, of the risk. You know, if it ends yeah. up, aside from the money they've put down into the deal, that's the, they're only limited to that amount of risk, right? Whereas like, if I don't run the deal right, I'm, I'm at risk for the whole thing. I'm at risk for the, the, the property, the, 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 my, my friends, my relationships, all of it. And that's right. not good. You know, that's not, so it's like, I got to, I want to make sure that the property, the deal is a good, solid deal. You know? Absolutely. So that's why for a limited partner, it, it works out well for them. You know, they, they get into a deal, they get all the benefits of real estate, they get taxed, they get the depreciation. Once we put in, uh, we, we, talk, we, we can accelerate the depreciation using different, different tools to make that happen. They get all that. And then they get, they also get appreciation as, as we improve the property. And we, and then one day we go to sell the property and say that million dollar property, I improve it so much. I kick out all the bad tenants bring in new tenants, crank up the rents, repaint it, make it look good. Now it's worth 2 million. I doubled that thing, right? Because I created so much value. Guess what? We take all that money and we split it 30, 70. It's a, it's a win-win, you know, and, yeah. all, and if they're using a 401k, all that money goes back into that, into that self-directed IRA and they can roll it back into another deal. It's, it's super, it's a super deal, super Absolutely. deal for a limited partner, you know? Yeah, but the operator is what matters, though. It's the operator. You know, it's, you, really, you really have to pick someone that knows what they're doing and uh, you know, they're, they're responsive. And you know what? Listen, not every quarter is going to be a stellar quarter. Some days are going to some, – some quarters, you know, a roof it goes bad. Uh, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, bad things happen on, on the property. You never know who's going to be in there. Even though you do your underwriting, you never know what happens. <laughs> Stuff yeah. happens. <laughs> There's people there. <laughs> so, 
Uh, but you know what, though? There's, there's nothing else like it. I'll put it to you this way. If, if, if you can go and get, would you be able to go to Bank of America and borrow money from them to buy their own stock? I mean, would they ever do that? Of course not. No. No, but they'll give you money to go buy a deal. They'll do that. <laughs> they'll do that all day long. Oh, 80%, 80 here's the 800,000. Take it, take it. Okay, you borrow the 800,000 to buy your stock. Oh, no, no, no. They don't even believe in themselves. <laughs> Not even a lender <laughs> believes in themselves. It's crazy. <laughs> and, and speaking of deals, uh, one thing that we, we do here is we are in, in up market. Things are just going up, which yeah. is fair, right? Factually, that's what's happening. But yeah. there are people out there that are of the mentality that I'm going to wait till it, it crashes or I'm waiting for the pieces to fall so that I can jump in. What right. would you say to to those types of people with that type of belief? It's funny how, how you said that, man, because uh, there's, so I've, I've been doing this for a while now, you know, this first was really like regular residential, now multifamily, and I'm scouting deals every day. You know, every day I'm talking to brokers and I'm, I'm out there. They know I'm out there, right? Uh, do I get a deal every day? No, but I'm talking to them. They know who I am. I know my market. My market knows me, you know? Um, there's one time I, I, was at a, I was at a deal. We did a, a tower, we bought a tower in, in, uh, in Cleveland. And um, this one, uh, the inspector uh, the works, for the, works for the lender, he says, you know, I, I don't, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna do it now. I'm gonna, wait for, I'm gonna wait for the pieces to fall, he says. Well, how many deals do you have now? None. Oh, you know any <laughs> brokers? No. Any lenders? No. Nope. I see. So. Let's say, for instance, the pieces do fall, and now there's all these deals all over the place. He has no money lined up. He's got no lenders lined up. He's got he's got no like he's got nothing, right? Yep. Yeah. I already have all the. He's got no brokers. I have the brokers. They know me. They know I can close, right? It's, I have the money lined up. I know where I can go get the money for the lenders because not all lenders are the same. Some lenders like certain assets, you know. These are all important things. It's either you're going to be in this business or you're not. It's as simple as that. It's, it's, you have to commit. The, the, the thing is you have to commit to doing this thing. This is not a part-time job. You know, for some people it is. But uh, it's funny how most people that, that consider this a part-time job, they want nothing more than to go into it full-time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Usually it's like, oh, I can't wait to, to get enough money to sort of quit my job and do that full time. It's, but it's true, right? But that's the thing. It's like if, if you, if you got you to commit, you got to go into it, you know, or at a minimum, do the work now to at least start building credibility so people know who you are. So when the pieces do fall, you'll be there to, to help bolster the economy because that's, that's what you're going to be doing. I mean, I'm going to be doing that too. It's, there's people out there are going to need people like us to go out there and buy these assets. They're going to need it. You know, it's, yeah. I, 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 and I, besides that, I also seem to think that if people are doing, if people are buying the asset at the right price and, and doing everything they're supposed to do on the underwriting side, they're, they're not going to lose. It isn't like we're expecting the whole thing, the whole bottom to fall out and everybody's going to be everything on, on fire. It's not going to be the case. Last time, this 0.4% default rate, 0.4. Wow, yeah. <laughs> on, on multifamily, on multifamily, yeah. right? It was the residential side, the uncash flowing residential side that suffered. Right. Not, not cash flowing multifamily. And now I think that statistic, if and you can, anybody can Google this, I'm not making this up, you can Google it. It's, it's, a, Fannie, it's a Fannie or Freddie um, chart, right? If you look up uh, economic chart, uh, the historical, um, I'm talking like B's and C's, you know, I, pri I primarily, yeah. my team and I, we buy B and C type properties. We don't, we, we generally stay out of a properties. Um, and we don't do war zone. We don't do class D's. We stay out of that too. So, uh, B and C it's great. You know, no matter what people need a place to live, it's, it's um, Maslow's Absolutely. hierarchy of needs. You got to know that, you know, it's the very first one right there at the bottom shelter. <laughs> <laughs> It's great. It's now to piggyback on that question for people that are waiting, when that crash happens, uh, how do you recommend investors prepare? Uh, well, you know, uh, you mean prepare right now, right? Prepare for that crash. Yes, right? prepare now, so, not prepare when it when it's happening. Yeah, 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 yeah. So you know, part of it is is that 
I mean, put it, setting aside cash is one thing, right? Making sure you have cash available. Uh, you don't want to keep so much cash lying around that's not doing anything, right? So meaning it's like you're going to keep like a million in cash just liquid lying there. It's like that's a, that's a lot of money not doing much of anything. Right. So, yeah. uh, but at the same time too, you also, you also have to gauge where we are in the economic cycle as well. Right. I don't, I don't know that the economy is going to crash like in the next year or so. Um, mm -hmm. you know, I, I don't even know if, if, depending on this next presidential cycle, if everything stays the same, we should be okay. I, I expect. Right. But part of it is to keep some liquidity. If you have like deals that, that you're just not good at running, unload those deals, you know, unload them, you know, make sure that the return is there. Like, listen, since we've scaled up our business, we have some, some, uh, some smaller properties that my property management group, they just, they just can't manage as well as some of the bigger stuff. Right. You know what? Sell those little ones to a smaller operator. They'll be perfectly happy running that deal. They'll be like, they'll, they'll love that. They'll, they'll, they'll love the opportunity to get into a multifamily deal right? We're just not geared to handle it anymore because we're doing, I'm trying to buy 200 units. This next deal I'm working on is 430 units. I can't effectively manage 22, 28 units. It's it just doesn't make any sense. Right. Agreed. But you know what, for someone that's starting out, Oh my God, 28 units would be a godsend, you know? So it's like, super, I'll let you guys handle that. I'll stick to what I know and what I do best, you know, the, and that's focusing on what you're good at is absolutely key. You know, and, and multifamily, like I said before, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, people are always going to need a place to live. So that's a long answer to your short question, Kevin, <laughs> but setting money aside and, and really focusing on the assets that you and your team can run effectively and very, very well, right? Just focus on those and maybe just divesting yourself of some of the assets that you're not so good at. You know, that's, that's probably the, the biggest advice I have. Good advice. Good advice. Thanks. Augustino, so we know you have a popular podcast, the Bulletproof Cash Flow Show. Yeah. What's something that you didn't expect to learn from launching your podcast? Wow. Um, you know, it's funny. There's, there's a lot of people in this business now. A lot of people. Wow. It's crazy. Uh, yeah, it's growing. <laughs> it's growing. Yeah. Uh, where... Uh, you know, maybe, and maybe that's another thing too, that the whole multifamily phenomenon. I think that guys like, uh, like Grant Cardone, for instance, he, mm -hmm. he really, he, he's, he's become somewhat of a, of a folk hero because he's a guy that transitioned from, from doing multifamily into having Snoop Dogg on a stage with him. Who would have thought that a multifamily <laughs> syndicator would be able to do something like that. Right? right. So, but, but the whole point is, is that there's plenty of people out there that do this. Um, and I think the fact that they freely share their knowledge is, is uh, it's rather refreshing, you know? So unlike other, other businesses where, uh, you know, if you have a, if, if HP has a podcast, they're, they're not going to invite Toshiba on their podcast and talk about computers, right? They're just right. not going to do that. They won't do that. Right. Cause that's a competitor. Competitors are bad. We must kill all competitors. Right. That's what they say. Right. Where in this business, it's, it's the opposite. You know, if, yeah. if I find a deal, which I did like this, this big deal downtown, I, I knew that I need help because I can't do that one by myself. It's going to be over a hundred million dollars. I need help with this one. Who am I going to call? I'm going to call my buddy. And then Adam. he and I are going to take it down. Right? <laughs> call Adam. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> We're going to call Adam. And, and then we, and then we work on it together and we take it down. You know, we put all the pieces together and we do it. So unlike other businesses, this business relies on, on partnerships to get some of those big deals done. Yeah. You know? So it's uh, from that perspective, it's, it's been um, very positive, very, very surprising. And it's, it's just great. It's great yeah, seeing the camaraderie. Cool. Yeah. 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 That's great. Well, Augustino, we can't let you leave without asking a tech related question. As such, we want to know what was your favorite video game as a young boy? Oh my God. So I, I have a young, young son right now and uh, he's nine and I just got him the Commodore 64. 
Nice. You just uh, that's how that? that's how old that's how old I am, right? When I was at his age, I was coding the Commodore sixty four because that's how you had to do it back then with the awesome. magazines. Yeah, you guys have no idea. That's how that's how we got games back then. They printed it in a magazine. You had to type it onto the yeah, magazine. I remember that one character at a time. So I would play. I would actually connect up with my buddy over uh, over the modem over my 300 baud or 1200 baud modem wow and uh and play doom that was my that was doom. My doom. Oh, yeah okay. yeah <laughs> doom yeah or castle wolfenstein one of those two they're basically oh, yeah. the same Old you know and, and just do that for like not for one or two hours no no no. that's unacceptable for a whole weekend like straight <laughs> yeah. i mean i was a, i was a stinky 12 year old kid just sitting there in the, in the room under blankets just playing games oh my god never left the room yeah <laughs> Terrible, terrible. Yeah, games. that's awesome. You always know you're going to get a good answer from a tech guy who invests about the video right. game question. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Well, Augustino, thanks so much. It's been fantastic having you on the show. It's just been a real pleasure. And I think you've added a ton of value to our users. So thanks awesome. for coming on. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it.